All right, how's it going, y'all? So a few days ago, I got this guy right here off of Craigslist, which is a computer that I'm going to be turning into a virtual host. So pretty much a server. So what I'm gonna be using it for is to set up virtual machines so I can easily run them. And I kinda of wanna talk about, honestly, how easy it is to get into this home lab space where you get to start running a ton of virtual machines, all for relatively cheap. You can get open source software incredibly easy. I'm gonna be using XCPNG in this right here, which is completely open source, really easy to use. And then Zen Orchestra on top of that to kinda of control everything. And getting the hardware for this is actually a lot easier than a lot of people think. You don't have to go out and buy a massive Dell PowerEdge off of eBay that sounds like a spaceship is taking off and spend a ton of money on stuff like that, all getting your own rack. That stuff is a lot of fun, but to honestly get into virtualization and setting up all these services, you can easily look at Craigslist and buy used computers and use them as awesome servers. I kind of want to talk about what things I looked for in, in this specifically to be a virtual host for a lot of services and what other options you've got, like setting up it all on an Intel Nook, which is like this, way smaller with less upgradability, but really low power draw and really easy to use. And nobody's going to get mad at you for having a little Intel Nook on your desk to have an entire home lab out of. So for the past few weeks, I've been kind of scouring Craigslist, which in my experience is probably the easiest place. I, I've not really gotten into Facebook Marketplace because I don't really use Facebook anymore. Is probably the easiest place to find a used PC for a good deal. For a regular used PC, I think that eBay's probably not the best place to go. I tried a lot there and it's just covered with people who are resellers who are going to send me a CPU from 10 years ago updated in a new case that's all pretty and is going to charge me way more than it's worth. And so I really could not find any good deals off of eBay. It was just a ton of massive resellers, but Craigslist had a bunch of different options, all relatively close to me, all with honestly really good pricing because you also don't have to pay the eBay fee as well or pay for shipping if it's Craigslist. And so when I was searching, I was really searching for a few specific criteria that this thing didn't meet. And what I was looking for first and foremost was going to be low power draw and low noise. That is always the first thing I look at whenever I'm looking into setting up a new server for my home lab because it can get out of hand fast and you can get to a place where you're installing extra breakers in your house to cover the amount of servers you've got and just your electric bill can go insane and it's really not worth it at that point. And so I really do focus on spend a little bit more upfront and that way you'll be able to run the server for a lot longer and not have these incredibly expensive power bills and things like that that just don't allow you to run it and keep these services always running. So the other thing I was looking for, which actually goes into the first two, was specifically something with DDR4 RAM. So DDR4 RAM has a lot lower power draw than DDR3 RAM. You can get DDR3 servers, which are just older overall, for a lot cheaper but they're going to have a lot worse power draw. And so for me, DDR4 was really important. So that way I could upgrade it down the line. It also gives you ability to have a lot more capacity without throwing in like 13 DIMMs in here and just overloading the thing. And so for me, actually DDR4 was one of the rules I had is I'm not gonna go DDR3, even if it's super cheap, because it's just going to not be worth it after a while, at least for me. It totally depends on your budget. If you're going for a really low budget and you just want to turn things on for a few hours a day when you're tinkering and turn them off, DDR3 is going to be fine. But if you want to be able to get a lot of RAM that's not going to absolutely kill your budget with electric bills, you're going to want to look at DDR4. And so then I was kind of looking for CPUs and it's a lot harder to be super specific with your exact CPU criteria when you're just going off Craigslist and especially when you have other criteria. But I really was hoping for something with like six to eight cores. This guy right here is a six core and unfortunately it does not have hyper threading. Hyper threading is when you get two threads per single core. So this CPU with hyper threading would have a six cores but 12 threads. And so hyper threading tends to get you about a 30% performance bump generally. It's not too big of a deal for me because RAM in this case is going to be a lot more important for me because I'm not going to be running anything that's super CPU intensive. Instead, I'm going to be having a lot of stuff running and overall schedulers work quite well and it actually runs quite efficiently overall. So six cores should be more than enough for all the services I'm going to be putting on it because it's not like everything's going to be hit at once. The one thing that might kind of hit it pretty hard is Plex, but the other thing I was looking for in a CPU, and this does have, is integrated graphics. So integrated graphics helps out for a couple of different ways. 
One, those commands are easily accessible by the actual virtual machines inside, rather than having to pass through graphics cards and things like that. And two, it means you don't have to pay for and have a bulky graphics card that is just sucking down extra power that you only need as a boot device. And so that means down the line, if I want to, I can get a cheap graphics card and throw it here and be able to pass it directly into a specific virtual machine if I want to go that route. But I don't have to have one for it to boot. I don't have to go through and have the annoying thing where, oh shoot, I've got a SSH in, I've got to grab a graphics card out of my computer, stick it in there, use that to boot and see everything. Instead, no, it's just got inbuilt graphics card, takes up next to no power, but also has a lot of great features because of that. And so that does have this, and that really just makes everything easier. Then along with RAM, I was hoping to have a motherboard with at least four DIMMs in it. Six or eight would have been great just because I can upgrade it later on. But this thing I actually got a great deal on because it has 48 gigs of DDR4 RAM in there. So it's three 16 gig DIMMs. I'm gonna buy four 16 gig DIMM just to keep it running efficiently because I don't really know how it's gonna be affected by having an odd number of DIMMs in there. It's working fine and all the memory is addressable. And I mean, CPUs can handle that, but it does tend to be a lot more efficient when you're running virtual machines if you've got an even amount of RAM so that the CPUs can index each of them identically and you don't have any weird mismatch stuff going on. So I'm gonna buy another stick of RAM, but I have three sticks of 16 gigabyte RAM. And so that means I have a ton, I have 48 gigabytes of RAM for this thing to run, which for me is huge. So when you're running virtual machines, the CPU is actually pretty much shared by all the different virtual machines. You specify how many virtual cores it's got, but if that virtual machine's not doing anything, it's not like it's going to be taking up that number of virtual CPUs. So what you can do is you can way over provision your actual CPU. You can easily have five times as many virtual threads, basically the total number of virtual machines times each of their number of threads in there. And you can easily have that to be five times the amount of actual threads in your virtual machine. The thing is, you cannot do this with RAM. Instead, the amount of RAM you set for a virtual machine, that is the amount of RAM it has and that's the amount of RAM it's gonna use. It doesn't matter if it's actually using all that RAM, it is going to take up that amount of RAM. There is a little bit of a different case and I've still not gotten fully into this, where XCPNG can actually go through and talk to the virtual machine and say, hey, you're not using that RAM, right? Okay, good, and take some of it away and allocate it to other virtual machines. So you can also actually over provision your virtual machines RAM. I'm actually going to disable that for now because I'm not gonna run into a RAM limitation, but it is a nice thing to have and I do need a lot more testing for it. But by having all of this extra RAM, I can run a ton of virtual machines all at the exact same time, all handling all these different services. This way, I don't have to use Docker. Docker would be more efficient. I would just have one virtual machine and tons of Docker containers. And that would be a lot more efficient when it comes to RAM. But because I have all this RAM, I don't have to do that. Instead, I have the ability to have every single one of these as a discrete virtual machine. They've all got their own IP addresses. They can all be updated independently. They can all be set up. I can SSH into all of them. They're all very real and they're easy to back up because that's how XCPNG likes it and Zen Orchestra, which controls all of this. And so it makes it a lot easier doing that, which is quite nice. And I can do a lot more cool stuff. I like Docker, but I also like being able to throw virtual machines around and start spinning them up and have templates and everything like that. That really just gives you a lot more customizability for every single service you choose to use. Now, the other really nice thing about this thing is right here. It has two NVMe SSD slots, which is awesome. So they're M.2 slots. So I just threw in two sticks. Actually, it came with one and I threw in another NVMe M.2 drive and that makes for insanely fast boot drives. So one of them is actually the boot drive for XCPNG. It's complete overkill, but it is nice to have. I probably will be switching this over to something else just because I don't wanna take up all the space because it's a very thin install. I might partition it off and use it for ISOs or something. And then the other one is used for the boot media. So right now this only has a one gig NIC in it. I am gonna be getting another one soon. I'm probably gonna get a card with like four SFP plus ports on it just to really do overkill and really have some fun. But until then, everything's running off the one gig NIC. And so that means that I really can't do shared storage because everything will get very slow. And so everything right now is booting off an NVMe SSD it is insanely fast and really low latency. 
So I'm gonna get actually really efficient virtual machines with this thing because it's not gonna to have to ask a network server and come back and have all that latency anytime it needs a file. Instead, it's going to go to the ultra fast NVMe drive and boot so quickly. It is amazing how responsive everything is, especially when I'm running a ton of services, especially when you're talking about something like a database, having local fast, fast storage is a really big thing to have. And the last thing I would look for whenever you're looking at a computer like this, which is a great option for a used server, is specifically the PCIe lanes you've got available to you. So this right here has two 16X PCIe lanes, as well as four 2X slots. So I don't have a ton of use for 2X slots because generally the network cards I need are gonna be like 4X slots, but having two 16X PCIe slots is going to be really nice because I can throw in a lot of things here. I can have one for a GPU pass-through and another for a really powerful storage NIC. And you just get a lot of flexibility by being able to do things like that. So the more longer PCIe slots you can get, the better in my experience for something like this. That is another real advantage of using a used PC as a server rather than something like a Dell PowerEdge. Because you can throw in any graphics card, anything that is compatible in here, which is pretty much everything that's PCIe, and it's not going to complain. When you get like an OEM solution like a Dell PowerEdge, you will run into some weird issues where they go, okay, you can put in a graphics card, I don't care. But then it will ramp all the fans to a thousand percent and you won't be able to stop them. And it will just be incredibly loud and completely unusable without you having any option to do it. Instead here, it's an Asus motherboard. I'm just gonna go through and go, and I can tune the fan curve to whatever I need it to be. And options like that just make it a lot easier and still being relatively cheap. There is a rack mounted tax. There is a server tax that you get that makes server components so much more expensive than regular consumer components. Now, to be fair, those are going to be higher quality, they're going to be more resilient, but at the same time, the reason they're so much more expensive is because businesses often rely on them and are going to call help desks a lot more, and it's going to be a lot more into it, and companies make a ton of money off this stuff. By getting all consumer parts, you can kind of throw your own stuff together for really cheap compared to buying server-grade equipment that is used, and you have a lot more flexibility with it. All right, well, that's gonna be it for this. Go and leave any other home lab tutorials you'd like to see you make in the comments below, and have a good one. Bye.